42 years after unbreakable encryption tools were first conceived that allowed individuals to communicate in private, they've finally gone fully mainstream. WhatsApp has uh, introduced a new level of encryption. Amazon's Fire OS 5 will offer full disk encryption. So encrypted, privacy protected, disappearing. One milestone came in 2016 when the world's largest messaging service announced it would offer default end-to-end -end encryption on all communications. WhatsApp messages can now only be read by their intended recipients and can't be accessed by anyone else, including governments or WhatsApp staff. Law enforcement and intelligence agencies are still reckoning with this new reality. For decades, they demanded tech companies hand over private data on their users, sometimes without obtaining warrants. So companies like Apple have changed their policies, making it so individual users are the only ones with the keys to their own data. Syed Farouk and his wife Tashfeen Malik opened fire. Hours later, they were in turn killed by police. This new era of consumer privacy led to a standoff in 2016, when the FBI demanded access to an encrypted iPhone belonging to a terrorist from San Bernardino, California. The FBI wanted Apple to write software that would weaken the iPhone's built-in security. Apple refused, telling authorities if the company were to create such flawed software that would work like a backdoor, it would create opportunities for hackers to steal private information. What is at stake here is, can the government compel Apple to write software that we believe would make hundreds of millions of customers vulnerable around the world? It is, in our view, the software equivalent of cancer. And yet there's plenty of consumer data that's unencrypted and accessible by large tech companies. From Facebook to Gmail, law enforcement can still get a warrant to get a hold of your data. But the growing use of end-to-end -end encryption by Apple in particular represents a drastic shift in power from government to individuals. But it's not as if unbreakable encryption popped up out of nowhere. It's the privacy community's answer to decades of government snooping. Year after year, technologists have battled the government in the so-called crypto wars, with the ultimate goal of giving individuals total control over their own privacy. <clears throat> Chair recognizes the senator from Delaware. In 1991, then-Senator Joe Biden introduced an anti-crime bill. It required that providers and manufacturers of electronic communications make it possible for the government to obtain contents of voice, data, and other communications when authorized by law. The best weapon against terrorism is sound intelligence, knowing in advance what is likely to occur, having information. Essentially requiring tech companies to provide back doors for government snooping. Programmer Phil Zimmerman decided to build a tool that would thwart Biden's efforts. He wrote the first attempt at an encryption program for the everyday user called Pretty Good Privacy, or PGP. After it was published online, it spread everywhere. Encryption is a way to scramble your communications. Cooper Quinton is a security researcher and technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. If I send you a letter, anyone that sees the letter can read it and see what it says. But if I scramble it, if I replace each letter with a different letter, then nobody's going to be able to know just by reading it what I sent to you. And encryption is basically just that, but with a lot of fancy math that makes it very, very hard to unscramble. We need encryption because we need to be able to tell secrets. Around the time Zimmerman was working on his encryption software, America was getting its first taste of the World Wide Web. An online network called Internet. Can you explain what Internet is? Prodigy is the online service that connects your computer to news, shopping, stores. America Online, a new way to use your computer. You start to see law enforcement getting nervous because they can see the writing on the wall. That's Julian Sanchez. He's a writer and senior fellow at the Cato Institute and focuses on national security and surveillance. Well, they can see that effectively widespread use of this network is going to require widespread use of encryption. And so there were a couple methods the government used to try to limit the growing use of encryption. As cryptographic tools were being developed within the country, these were effectively, under the law, treated as munitions, as essentially weapons being exported. And so they were subject to limitations on the strength of the key. The key is a string of numbers, letters, and characters that unlocks encrypted messages. And the longer it is, the more complicated the mathematical equation at its root, which makes it harder to break. In 1993, the Justice Department launched a criminal investigation of Zimmerman on the grounds that he violated the Arms Expert Control Act. The idea was that by publishing a tool as powerful as PGP at protecting encryption, he was guilty of exporting munitions. To demonstrate that PGP was protected by the First Amendment, Zimmerman got MIT Press to print out its source code in a book and sell it abroad. Justice Department officials never indicted Zimmerman, and they began a long process of coming to grips with the legal and technical challenges of regulating software, so challenging that they went into the software business themselves. 
And at the same time, there was an attempt to sort of preempt stronger domestic encryption technologies by offering their own alternative. And so that's when the government developed a proposal that was known as the Clipper Chip. The Clipper Chip was an encryption tool developed by the National Security Agency that had a built-in way for the government to gain access to the information. It was the first backdoor. A backdoor is an intentional flaw in a security system that lets you and only you gain access to the system that you wouldn't otherwise have. The idea was to make the Clipper Chip an industry standard by taking advantage of the government's purchasing power. The privacy advocates fought back. This was really the first crypto war. The fight between law enforcement and governments and a whole lot of computer scientists and privacy activists over whether the Clipper chip would become the standard for encrypted telephone communications. The Clipper chip represents a new approach to encryption technology. Well, I don't think that there's anything scary about the uh, Clipper chip proposal. Our society also expects to be safe from crime. Why, in the name of Zeus, would anybody outside the United States buy one of these things if you've got that insidious little spy in it. It's a fight it looked like the government might win until a computer scientist named Matt Blaze discovered certain flaws in the Clipper algorithm, which everyone had been sort of assured was, was absolutely airtight, showing that, you know, first that it would actually not be that useful for the purpose law enforcement intended, but also that the government was perhaps not as good as evaluating whether encryption technologies worked as advertised. Typically, when you try to invent your own cipher, you end up um, exposing your own information to somebody who's just a little bit smarter than you or somebody who has the access to information that you did, just didn't happen to know. An ever-present theme in the crypto wars is that the government is always a step behind the privacy community in developing encryption technologies. Just the fact that the FBI thought Apple had access to the data on the San Bernardino terrorist's iPhone is evidence of how out of touch the agency often is. After the Clipper Chip episode, law enforcement agencies seemed resigned to the new era of encrypted telecommunications. There was even a compromise of sorts between telecommunications companies and law enforcement called the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act. Companies could still offer encryption, but they had to preserve the ability to wiretap. They would be under no obligation to guarantee the ability to decrypt. That was sort of the trade-off. So on paper, it looked like the crypto nerds had won, but in secret, we now know that the intelligence agencies were not lying down and accepting defeat. The NSA specifically targets the communications of everyone. They're capturing the, the data as it moves across the when net. When you call grandma in Nebraska, the NSA knows. The Snowden revelations revealed spying, but also how the NSA was surreptitiously targeting encryption. One of the ways was by corrupting a widely used software program called Dual EC with malicious code. The program was used by many big companies to generate the language that made up the key that was used to unlock encryption. Not a pure backdoor, but they had what's called sort of a shortcut. But using the shortcut didn't last long. Researchers who used Dual EC quickly figured out the algorithm was compromised. The NSA went back to the drawing board. The problem for intelligence agencies is that encryption is math, and so you can pretty much be 100% confident that you know how secure something is. The math tells you this can't be broken, and being a big government with a lot of money to throw at it doesn't change the math. The answer, when you know you can't break the encryption, is break the endpoint. The endpoint turned out to be the hardware people use to connect to the internet. The NSA is planting backdoor spyware in American-made computer devices before they are shipped overseas. The result of this was, unsurprisingly, a fair amount of anger from the companies that are responsible for making this stuff. The CEO of Cisco sent a pretty irate letter to President Obama saying, in effect, I can't do business under these conditions. And the head of Cisco wasn't the only one. The growing outrage over NSA snooping began to grow in Silicon Valley after the Snowden leaks. They didn't knock, they didn't call, they didn't send a letter. If you don't comply, it's treason. You know, so frankly, I, I, I think that the, the government blew it. Companies like Apple and Google reacted to the NSA's actions by announcing they would strengthen encryption in their products. As unbreakable encryption becomes more widespread, law enforcement still acts as if backdoors are a viable option. The FBI supports information security. We support strong encryption. But information security programs need to be thoughtfully designed so they don't undermine the lawful tools that we need to keep this country safe. It's sort of too late to rebottle the genie. 
what would make more sense is to accept that encryption is a good thing that makes us all more secure and that building vulnerabilities into it is probably going to impose more security harms than benefits it's going to create for law enforcement. What's worse is that the government may never realize how important secrets are to every single part of our lives. Telling secrets is fundamental to modern society, it's fundamental to any sort of economy, and it's fundamental to democracy. I need to be able to tell you secrets. I need to be able to think secret thoughts so that I can push the bounds of my society and challenge it. The government is losing the latest battle in the crypto wars, but there are new tools on the horizon like quantum computing, which could break many standard encryption algorithms and shift power back into the hands of the state. But history shows that while the fight is never over, technologists have managed to remain one step ahead of the government, developing new tools and strategies that protect individual privacy from the overreaches of the surveillance state.